I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Ron Lohman of Synopsys, who's going to talk today about memory access considerations in AI chips. So Ron, we're dealing with a lot of data that needs to be moved through here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, max memory scattered all over the place. What kinds of considerations do you have to think about as you're moving into designing these chips? Yeah, one of the, the major considerations that our customers are having to deal with is really just the, the energy used with respect to AI. And it starts with your multiply, uh, accumulates, your, your multiplies, your adds. Uh, but the memory access are playing a huge role in the overall power uh, consumption. In fact, you know, AI computation can take up to 10% energy use just fetching from DRAM. So we've seen that in certain um, uh, examples. And so it plays a huge role in the overall architecture of your des design. And part of the problem here is that this is the kind of data that you typically processed in the cloud before, but now you want to move this closer to the edge to reduce the latency, but it's also adding a lot more uh, compute intensiveness that you, than you had in classic IoT devices. Yeah, and one of the big restrictions you have as you move out of the cloud closer to the application is your uh, compute resources and your memory resources are restricted because um, the, the chips are, are much smaller and, and you don't have as much resources to deal with that you would have in the cloud. And so uh, careful architectural considerations have to take place up and down the, the infrastructure from application to the cloud. So let's drill down into this. Sure, so one of the big considerations is how do you manage uh, accessing both on-chip and off-chip memory? Of course, for AI applications, you wanna try to do everything on-chip. And on-chip has different types of technology starting with basic SRAMs. Um, you have register files, caches, um, uh, global SRAMs. Um, these are, are very important on, on trying to get the, the sizes uh, right to be able to handle the expectations of the AI algorithm you, that you're running. And um, this plays a big role in the overall um, fetching the, the coefficients and the, the parameters from these memory spaces plays a big role. But the AI algorithms are too large, so you still have to have off-chip memory. We've been used to dealing with on-chip memory for a lot of the devices that we've designed in, in the, this industry. Some of this is off-chip memory as well, and some of this is even going into uh, packages. What happens here? What are some of the considerations that you have to think about as you're designing these chips? Well, let's start with the on-chip memory considerations, and, and I've written it up here on my board. So for on-chip, we have uh, different technology. We have register files, we have, um, we have caches, and we have global SRAMs. We even have latch-based SRAMs that could play a role here uh, longer term. Um, but one of the technologies that we've seen adoption is multi-port SRAMs. And because this is important because it gives a lot of parallelism. And in theory, if you make, have parallelism, you reduce the power consumption when you go and fetch these coefficients and parameters. So these are your options, but again, you can't fit everything on chip. So you have to have off chip. And there's lots of different technologies off chip. And of course, they all have different power consumption, different density, different capacity considerations. One of the big changes here that as you start designing these chips, particularly at, uh, AI chips that are working on the edge, is that you're now dealing with lots of different compute elements that are sometimes working in parallel, sometimes working in the, independently, as well as some SRAMs, which are sometimes small SRAMs are close to that. There are other SRAMs that are being utilized by all the stuff. How do you make sure that everything's connecting to the right memory? Well, ideally, you'll know which AI app, uh, uh, algorithm you have to run, but we don't live in an ideal world. And so a lot of times these chips have to accommodate many different algorithms. Um, so they use uh, certain specific examples. ResNet 50 is an example that's used quite often to be able to do these benchmarks. We actually have some tools to help model uh, these things on chip so that architectural considerations can be, be adopted, especially when it comes to off-chip memories. So let, let's kind of list what types of off-chip memories there are. Traditionally, there's always been uh, DDR, there's LPDDR, and with the advancement of AI, we've seen high bandwidth memories like HBM2E 
And now we're seeing adoption of HBM3. Most of this stuff has happened at the most advanced nodes though, right? So you think about where people have been willing to spend money for that kind of packaging and the HBM. It's primarily been in the most advanced nodes. A lot of the stuff in the edge is starting to move back a bit simply because it's too expensive. And one of the variables that they have is to go to older nodes and potentially put some of these pieces together. What impact does that have on the power and the memory? Yeah, it, it, of course, as you move down the process nodes, the memory consumption of the embedded SRAMs um, will be reduced. And so we see a lot of uh, AI chip companies adopting some of the most aggressive process nodes. We've seen a lot of uh, adoption at seven nanometer, now discussions in, in further technologies. Um, and so if you look at kind of the comparison of why you want to fit everything on chip uh, compared to off chip um, is, you know, accessing something at a DDR uh, versus a, a standard SRAM could be about 100 times um, higher when it comes to picojoule per bit comparisons. It sounds as if you're taking almost everything you have in your quiver here for all the tools and saying, throw it all at the same problem because you, this problem is multidimensional and it's moving in a lot of different directions. There is a lot of different tools in the toolbox, um, but you really got to segment this into what the end application is trying to accomplish. So I've kind of written down three different types of AI accelerators that we see on the market. And the first one's really in the cloud, right? And these guys, the goal is performance. And so they're using um, the highest bandwidth technologies available. So you'll see um, a lot of HVM adopted here. You'll also see the use of things like multi-port SRAMs. And our multi-port SRAMs can go up to eight reads and eight writes. So, you know, we don't, necessarily see that, but you do see a lot of um, parallelism being adopted into the cloud. For edge computing, they're a little more cost sensitive, and they're also trying to reduce power when they're not being used. And this is where LPDDR can play a big role, and we're seeing that adopted in some of these uh, edge computing technologies, or SOCs. For edge device, and the reason I call it edge device is because these are accelerators that are really meant to accompany an applications processor, maybe a camera um, processor that is uh, trying to do the offload the AI acceleration. And you see some really unique things here where customers are, are using some uh, maybe on-chip memory technologies that support both in-memory and near-memory compute capabilities. The key here is to process and uh, eliminate as much data as you possibly can before you have to figure out what do you do with this, right? So you really want to say, okay, this is important, this is not, and this needs to be sent to the cloud for further processing. This, this stays here and never moves off this device. Yeah, so um, the one thing that's unique about the three different spaces that I described is in the cloud, you don't really prune any of these algorithms. There's no compression and pruning. Whereas here at the edge device, there's some assumption that you're gonna hold ahead and prune this. One of the difficulties is when you do things like that is that the memory accesses become more irregular. And so it consumes more power with irregular memory accesses. Here in edge devices on the processing side as well, you'll see some interesting technologies, maybe analog processors play a role too. So how do these different different approaches compare in terms of how much power they actually use and how do you measure that? Yeah, so um, you can kind of look at the different IP that, that we provide. Um, and, and I did mention earlier that, you know, when you compare on-chip SRAM to a traditional DDR, it's about 100 times more uh, memory consumption to access it from DDR. But if you normalize some of the most advanced technologies of HBM, and these things, HBM3, for instance, is pushing uh, the sub picojoule per bit um, uh, capabilities uh, to about about one. If you look at previous technologies, it's about 2x for HBM2E, about 4x for LPDDR, and uh, about 10x uh, today with, with DDR. So you've seen kind of a, a trade-off with respect to power on the different types of technologies being adopted. But then, of course, like you talked earlier, is that there are packaging cost considerations with some of these technologies. There's capacity capabilities with respect to DDR, um, and LPDDR in a low power state can be turned off and, and 
consume very little. So how does that change from going on a single chip to die to die type of communication? Yeah, so that's one of the most interesting things with respect to AI is, is, is that the algorithms are so complex that a single die can't necessarily uh, handle the, all the compute required, nor the amount of memory needed. And so instead of just leveraging these off-chip memory interfaces, customers are building die-to-die -die connections that will leverage the on-chip SRAM from an additional chip. So we see different technologies being adopted with respect to our high-speed surdies. And this comes in two different flavors. One of our long range was as a typical ethernet technology, and that'll be connected to like a backplane. Then we have our uh, extremely short reach and ultra short reach solutions, which are meant to really for die to die connections rather than a, a chip to chip connection. Um, and that's being adopted pretty broadly, both in the cloud as well as in edge computing. And, and most recently we've actually added a high bandwidth interface to it to our portfolio, which is kind of a par is, which is really a parallel interface that does die to die connectivity. This is where we actually can optimize from a picojoule per bit perspective, and HBI actually performs similarly to HBM three. A lot of these are very customized depending upon what you're going to use it for, and the edge is full of very narrow uh, verticals as well as some horizontal place across them. Uh, for things like memory. How do you determine which one you're going to use? What's your, what's your optimum choice? What's your trade-off? Because this is all a series of trade-offs, right? In order to solve your bottlenecks. Yeah, absolutely. And so the different segments will choose different IP. Um, I talked about um, HBI. Now this requires similar packaging to HBM2 and HBM3. And so these are more commonly being used together for cloud applications, uh, but those are, that are more cost conscious, they'll adopt an, an LPDDR with a high speed uh, short range CERTES uh, for your edge computing applications. When you get to edge devices, what's interesting there is they may be adopting some high speed CERTES, but more likely they're actually adopting a PCIe to a PCIe switch and then they're trying to leverage only on-chip memories and trying to get rid of external memories altogether. So that's another unique architecture that you see out there. Are things ending up more in one bucket or another, or is everything still totally unique and everybody's finding their way in this space? There's a lot of uniqueness. Everybody wants their special sauce. You can see that there's been a lot more development in the cloud. These solutions are probably a little bit more mature. We're starting to see an uptick in edge computing. Everybody's trying to find that new space. As 5G gets rolled out, it's important to be able to handle where these will be located and, and the power consumption considerations there. Uh, edge devices, I think that this is a, a longer term frontier because some of the advanced technologies uh, that are being used with respect to maybe analog compute or some of the advanced memories beyond just standard SRAMs that require in-memory compute. So, there's just all kinds of options out there and everybody's trying to design something special. Once you get beyond the cloud, is there any way to actually say this one is faster than this, this one is lower power than this, or does it depend upon the configuration of exactly what they're trying to do for a specific use case? It's so very unique because the software is moving so fast. The AI algorithms are being updated uh, so quickly. There's so many different parameters I think it's hard to focus just on the hardware for a specific application uh, unless the same person's doing all the comparisons because there's so many different parameters to, to turn. This is not like the days where you took one PC and put against another PC and ran exactly the same program, right? This is a, we're trying to do something very unique here. Yeah, and everybody's, what's interesting is everybody's trying to find their niche too. So, you know, somebody may have um, a special, um, way to do you know digital television or with with um, or somebody may have uh, a way to do facial recognition or somebody may have a way to do voice recognition and all of these are are very different it's a huge space there's lots of different segments and i think that's going to continue to expand well this is the golden age for design and design tools right because now you have all this freedom to be able to try all these things that you couldn't do before 
Yeah, and honestly, that brings up a really good topic is that a lot of our IP that I've mentioned here is modeled in some synopsis tools um, from some of our other groups that they're able to tune these things, do parameter sweeps on different configurations of these, this IP, and really optimize it for their application. You know, those that are designing for specific applications like maybe an ADAS, they may have a big advantage because they can tune this just right. And there's all kinds of different knobs, like I said. Ron Lohman, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Well, thanks for having me.